Why Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Why Guru Ji Ki Fateh. My name is Jocelyn Gore, and I'm a research associate at Sikri. Um, I'm joined here today by Harinder Singh, who is a co-founder of the Institute and also the innovation director. Fateh Harinder Singh, thank you for joining me. Why Khalsa, Why Ji Fateh. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, so, Shabad Hazare Bat Shahi Dasmi. What does this mean? What does this title mean? What can you tell us about this before we get started? I think that the, the, the best thing to do is probably just talk about each of these words. You know, the, the commonly, uh, traditionally among many six, the word is Shabad, which in Guru Granth Sahib's inspiration is Shabad. So what is this Shabad? And that's what intrigued me about it, that when we do talk about the 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, we generally don't talk about Shabads. And here is a title which says Sabad itself, what is generally called Shabad. So that's the first word. Mm -hmm. The second word, the popular word is Hazare. Like I have done that, you know, in the, in the context of Guru Arjan Sahib, there's a tradition to do Sabad Hazare, which are Shabads of his. And in Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, we also use this word. And I started looking into it. And what I discovered is that it is actually Hajare. Because Hajare comes from Hijr. Hijr means separation. It's an Arabic word, Hijr. And Hazar is thousand. And some people have also presented this as being, you know, if you recite, recite this thousand times, uh, something will happen to you. But really what makes sense is because there's a yearning for union with the one throughout all of these 10 sabbaths. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hajare makes more sense, which comes from Hijr. And probably because, you know, nasalization of certain words uh, has happened. Similarly, Jajja and Zaza, that has happened in the script. Uh, when I saw the powerful accents of pangs and longing within these sabbats, Hajare made a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. and then the next word, again, popularly is Patshahi. But originally, it's Patsahi. Patsahi is the sovereign, mm -hmm. the sovereign who is of both the words. Uh, uh, classically, it means the world we live in and the world beyond. In the Sikh parlance, it also means uh, what the world divides uh, things into religious, spiritual, or the political world. Mm -hmm. So that's Patsahi. And Dasmi here means the tenth, as we see the connection between from Guru Nanak through Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. So it refers to the, these sabads, which are about in separation, wanting to be in the union of the sovereign who we identify as the tenth. Hence, Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. Yeah, well, I've never thought about Hazare versus Hajare. Like, I've just never, I don't have the linguistic background to know the difference. So that's really interesting. Um, and I'm not saying that what is popular is wrong. There is no wrong. This is what I have discovered. Yeah. And if somebody wants to, I have also in kathas and in, in some uh, explanations, people have also said it has to do with Hazra Azur. So the way you feel the presence. Mm -hmm. But when we really look at it from a language perspective, a thematic perspective, and the original impetus, the hijr and hajare makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very interesting. Um, I was going to ask you, because, you know, we both work on Guru Granth Sahib Project. And something that we've talked about a lot as a team is that, like, even though we are working on things as, like, a Sikri project, there is kind of, we always use the word selfish and I don't really like that word, but it's like, there is a personal investment that we have in these projects. And I can see it anytime we're working on any Bonnie, any composition. Um, and so I wanted to ask you kind of a twofold question, which is why, why this project from a Sikri angle, but also like why this project from a personal angle, like what does it mean to you? Because I think that's what makes the work we do so much richer. Um, yeah, I was just curious about that. Well, the part of the curiosity can be fulfilled by, if, let me see if I can share two responses. The Sikri part is very simple. Every year we try to find something new, something inspiring, something which has, which can connect the seekers with the Guru's wisdom, Guru's mat, Gurmat, because we are a Gurmat based organization. We like to present things from the Guru's mind as we can interpret and understand. And that's what creates the Guru's thought or Guru's wisdom. So the seekers, those who are wanting to develop the relationship with Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj through his wisdom, 
as well as those who are studying Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj and the Sikhs, they can all figure out how to see, how to visualize the Guru through the Shabad, through the wisdom, through the infinite wisdom within the Shabads, instead of the portraits, because a lot of focus has been on the portraits lately as well. And it will always be there. It was there 100 years ago. It will remain in there in its new forms. But can we connect it through the Shabads? The Shabads, which are attributed to Guru Bin Singh Maharaj, uh, can we understand the wisdom within there? And can we explore that? So that's the Sikhri angle to it. Personally, you know, uh, as well as in Sikhri, I would say this particular point, I am... We work on a project together on Asana Kiva. Remember, there's a line in there in one of the parties, Satgur Vada Karsa Laiya, just which Vadiya Vadiya. That it is to the six of the Guru to be able to praise and tell the glory of the Guru, mm-hmm. of the eternal Guru. And we identify that Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, Guru Nanak through Gobind Singh Maharaj are the embodiments of that wisdom, which came from the ultimate wisdom, which is the divine, the Kovankar, the one force, which is creative and pervasive. So this is an attempt to tell the greatness of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, because he has greatness within him, in his life, in his wisdom, in the way he lived on this earth. And even if those who believe that this is not directly his contributions or his compositions or his Bani, it's okay. They're describing his thought process. So this is where my personal element comes in, where I believe that there is a very widening and very painful and very worsening gap Mm. between uh, the well-wishers and well-intentioned people who are otherwise very pantic Mm. regarding some of these compositions. So I looked at, can I work on something with the team here so we can actually try to minimize that gap? So we can at least agree on the wisdoms of it. And the word Shabbat is being used here. Patsa is being used. Tasvi is being used. And it is about the hijr. It's about ending a separation with the one. So I thought this could be one way to bring who are otherwise very well-intentioned, well-wishers uh, within the Sikh community who are taking some strong positions on Bani's attribute to Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. And these set of 10 uh, help us at least understand some of the wisdom of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. Yeah, that's. I think that's important because we've sort of talked a little bit about like, it feels like there's like a barrier to getting to know Guru Gobind Singh a lot of the times because we get caught up in these arguments about like what is authentic and what isn't. And, and that just becomes the starting and ending point of the conversations we have. And so I, for a long time, felt like I didn't really know Guru Gobind Singh in the same way that like we we sort of are able to and emphasize the importance of lear- uh, like learning or getting to know about Guru Nanak Sahib, for example. So I definitely like even coming to like Jap Sahib was really late for me in life. Like it was like a thing that I kind of thought was controversial or like or like, uh, yeah, people had disagreements about. And so it's interesting that we've interesting and sad that we've created these kinds of arguments that obstruct us from even getting at the thing that we're arguing about to see what it could, yeah, what it could teach us or show us. Um, and so I really appreciate that. I'm really excited to kind of get into these. Um, uh, so Jocelyn, you know, I've had conversations on this matter with other people, including some very big brand artists, mm-hmm. you know, who are drawing Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj in the portrait capacities, whatever they might be, we can have disagreements on that. But when they ask me for opinion, and I ask them before I say anything, what did you do to visualize Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj? Mm. And they don't have answers. Because we are not making an attempt to create something. I mean, connection comes later. You know, first there is beauty. There is elegance to things. And then those things inspire us. Mm. And combine that with the thought, then we may be able to visualize and hopefully connect someday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is in our psyche. The Sikh psyche has that, but we are not able to get there because we are afraid to approach or we have been made, uh, not created access to approach Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, even if it is through the compositions uh, which may or may not be directly attributed to Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, but can we at least try to understand them and take inspiration from them, especially if they have they don't have anything which is 
against the ideas of the guru, against the gurma. So at the highest level, they're directly of the gurus. At even a smallest level, they're inspiring the guru's wisdom. Hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, well put. Um, I, I was going to ask you about like the objective and the vision of the project. I think you've sort of gotten to it in a way through the things that we've already talked about, but is there a simpler way to state like what the objective and the vision of this project is before we get into kind of the process? Well, the, the vision is that can we make um, from a text base, because we work on a lot of Gurmat is based on Pani, mm -hmm. and then you have history around it, and then you have Rehat, as we call it, from its relevance today, right? So with, when it comes to Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, we need to be able to find that space of Pani, mm -hmm. and this is an attempt to create that space. You know, this is not to fuel divisions. This is to actually lessen that. And from a seeker's perspective, it is Shabbat. Mm -hmm. The language, for example, here, you know, it's Braj language with plentiful uh, sort of context of incredible context of uh, what we generally call popular Hinduism now. You know, what are the yogis up to? What is the Shaivite system? What is the Vaishnavite system, which is popularly called Haris and Krishnas and Vishnus and asceticism and worships and idolatries and all sorts of things. That's the context of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. And in these compositions, these 10 sabbats, you have six rags also, which is again in line with larger Guru Granth Sahib, right? Those six rags are also found in Guru Granth Sahib. Rag Ramkali, Rag Surat, Rag Kalyan, um, Rag Tilang Kafi, Bilawal and Dev Gandhari, and one of them is in Khyal Gaiki. So there is a lot of correlations there. You know, um, the nine of the ten Shabads have Rahau lines in them. Only the Khyal one doesn't. You know, so that again is a big thing. Where are we asking to be pausing and reflecting in the context of what these Shabads are saying instead of getting confusions and be involved in the doubts? Because that's where seekers are, right? They need what is the shepherd telling me to connect with so I can end my separation? And you know, a lot of historicity is around them too. Generally accepted view is other than the Khyal Shabad, uh, Mitar Pyarenu Shabad that is, that, that was in the Machiwade jungles. Rest of them were, uh, the, their origination spot or space is Anandpur Saab. So there is a lot of that going on and they inspire us to create our protocols, which have been, uh, articulated in various ways, but it is coming out of these Shabbats. So really, um, the vision I was having, to be honest, it was last year around this time. And I was looking at that how in last five years, uh, we are commemorating Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj, mm -hmm. the kind of vocabularies we have done and the exhibitions we are doing, how they are not connecting people and we are actually become quite vulgar in our approaches and they're not helping anyone. How can they, they're not helping scholars. They're not helping deep dive students. They're creating more wedges. So what can we do? So this elegance, this inspiration, this connection can come out for seekers at least. Yeah, I know. I don't want to get too ahead of myself because I've already read the translations and there are so many lines in there that are just so, they just hit you so <laughs> right in the heart, the way that like the rhythm is and the way that the phrasing is and the like attributes that are that are invoked are just so beautiful. So I'm really excited to get into that, but I won't, I won't get ahead of myself. But, but I love that element because you're excited about it. And this is what I, this is what I'm hoping it will do. It will create excitement towards for the guru. Yeah. And if scholars want a debate, maybe they'll do better research before the debate and they'll choose better words. But really that's not the agenda. Primary yeah. agenda is, can we be excited and understand guru through the text? Yeah. You know, text which is not in confrontation or against our litmus test in Guru Granth Sahib. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's a great segue into the question about process because even though the primary goal is not textual analysis. That's not to say that a great deal of work didn't go into coming up with kind of the 
the source from which you worked. Um, and so I, I know from our conversations that there were many manuscripts um, and that no two were alike. And so my initial question is kind of simple and maybe it's a little flip, but like, how did you even begin? Um, like, how did you even start with, with that and, and eventually choose um, what to use and what to kind of leave? What was the process for that? Yeah, I mean, that's a journey in itself, which took months. I thought it was going to be a couple of week journey, uh, you know, maybe three, four weeks. Honestly, we started like, what is most accessible to people? Yeah, because That's where we started. And the most accessible things are, you know, what are now on the Sikhi to the Maxes or Search Kurbani mm -hmm. or other, you know, online things. Yeah. And I asked a calligrapher, Alveil Singh, I said, why don't you study this? Let's use the most accessible one and let's start creating a beautiful calligraphy, uh, which we can create uh, and display and get people inspired to the words itself. Because sabad is word and a sound, right? So this is the word part, the beauty in the word itself, the letters themselves. And when he, when he started on it, he's like, oh, I'm finding some of the fonts issues are showing up. Some of the matra issues are showing up which are vowel symbols, you know, how the particular word ends. Mm -hmm. And he says, that's, that's not what I'm used to because he was also a practitioner. Mm -hmm. he, he used to recite this. So it's important, right? They, we are not just studying this. We are not just presenting this. We have been uh, sort of have our own relationships with these over the years, mm -hmm. knowing very well what the issues are in the community in the pond. So that put a pause and we agreed to do certain things. I said, okay, let me look at maybe that's not the best way to do this because there are more problems. Some of the words were completely different as well. Initially, I then looked at, you know, let's see what, there are these words, you know, the, the word codex get used a lot in the, when people are studying the Samgranth, regardless of their positions. Mm -hmm. So there is something called Anandpuri codex. There is something called Baba Deep Singh codex. I even looked at volumes, which are presented as being the ones at Moti Bagh and Sangroor and Patna. And essentially what I was trying to get at was, can I find a collaboration, including a volume which was published in 1895? So sort of based on that, for calligraphy purposes, we settled on a text. Hmm. But it got much more interesting than that. I mean, that ended within a month. You know, <laughs> and then I was like, you know, the, the Shabad is also the sound. How we get, let's find someone who can recite this because seekers need the recitation as well. What does this word sound like? And we looked at popular people in the world, people who have done this already. And we found that because of the spelling issues, because of the pronunciation issues, that's something we had to come up with on our own. Mm -hmm. So we have a person who works on the Guru Granth Sahib team, Harjinder Singh Karsana, he is known. He lives in Rajasthan. I talked with him and I said, I would like you to do this because you have understanding of the text, you have understanding of the traditions, and you have understanding of the language. Mm. Uh, and he has his own relationship with these because he has personally looked at many manuscripts. And when he created a first sample, he's like, Virji, there are issues here. There are words which are not making sense here. I'm like, I know I'm struggling and this is why I'm not starting the translation on commentaries on it. In fact, I didn't even do transcription for it yet because it's unsettling on what to do with this. Mm -hmm. So then we went on a much larger and a deeper study of this, which took us through, you know, what are Nihang Singhs looking at? Mm -hmm. What are people who have academically studied looked at? What are people who are within the Dasam Granth debate, uh, who are even all pro Dasam Granth, what are they saying about it? And there is no correlation, no agreement on the text. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do then was we said, OK, where is it that it's more than one person? And this becomes very, very interesting. And we found that the study, which was published by uh, Punjabi University Patiala, it had multiple people involved with it. It was published under, uh, it's called Pairantir Singh, but he's not Pairantir Singh of Akhant Kirti Jatha. We settled on that. And one of the reasons we settled on that was because that uh, publication was done after uh, this is Pairantir Singh. He's also called Oriental Scholar. He discussed all those issues with a team of scholars like Dr. Taran Singh, Dr. Prem Prakash Singh, um, 
Professor Gulwant Singh, Dr. Jeet Singh Seetal, and they further consulted this with Sardar Kirpal Singh Narang and Pai Jod Singh at a time. So that became part of our extended text eventually. But then we noticed there were issues in there because uh, when we were trying to do, trying to do interpretations, uh, it, some of it wasn't making sense. So we, I know it's getting a little bit technical, but if you allow me a couple of more minutes on this, then we looked at, because that study is old, who are the most recent people who have been looking at it? And then we found a Gutka produced by uh, Gurvinder Singh Nangli, his name is, and he is part of, uh, um, you can say that there are people who are studying this in the particular denominations among the six, right? So he's part of Tarnadal, Baba Gajan Singh's Tarnadal, and uh, from Baba Bakala. Uh, he published a part of that. So we also looked at that. So we said, okay, Pai Ranthir Singh becomes the basis. Let's do some corrections based on him. But we also looked at many other things and we had to correct more things. Uh, we looked at uh, three handwritten manuscripts uh, uh, of uh, digital copies of them, you know, which date from 1777, 1796, and 1864. We also looked at um, uh, the publication of the standard text in Jawahar Singh's and Kripal Singh's thing. We also looked at uh, <laughs> what Ratan Singh Jaggi, what he has done. He has something called uh, Part Sampadana Te Vyakhya. And so there is a lot of work which went into it. And eventually we said, okay, we, we, we have to make sense for ourselves. That doesn't mean much more research is needed on it. We have to make sense for it ourselves which is primarily for a seeker to be able to come up with interpretation and a commentary. And for that, we did more textual uh, changes to standardize them just for this project. Mm -hmm. The month needs to work on it. Serious scholars need to work on it. And to be honest, I think we end up making uh, Harjinder Singh and myself, instead of one meeting, I think we did like more than 10 meetings on this. Yeah. And we end up making 15 different notes on it after studying all this. And we basically, we only made one note eventually, and which was the work we started out. This is at the back end of all this, that for Harjinder Singh to actually recite this in the utmost devotion, because him and I are very clear on that. This was our purpose. We just came up with the simplest rule that pronunciation needs to follow a simple non-discretionary uh, discretionary pattern, which is meant for masses, which is pronounced the way it is inscribed, the way it is written which means we had to agree on the spellings, which means we had to agree on the text. So sorry, that's a long-winded answer of that. You know, when I was uh, in uh, college days, I remember writing a, or having a discussion and eventually writing a little piece called Problems and Research in Sikhism, right? Mm -hmm. And then we discovered another multi-layered sort of issue of that when we were working on this project. Uh, I think that it's fascinating. So I'm glad <laughs> glad you went into detail. I I wanted to get a couple of um, sort of examples of the variation in the text and how you dealt with it, because I know you had pointed to someone we had talked the other day about like the ways that even the smallest discrepancies can can cause a change in meaning in the line and how context is really important for kind of figuring out how to deal with that. Um, so I'm sure like listeners would love an example or two about on, on that issue because um, I found it really fascinating. Yeah, so I mean, some of them change meaning, some don't. So let me give you an example of one each, right? So one thing was there were words where Adhak, you know, uh, which is not uh, present in Guru Granth Sahib, but it is present in the Bani attributed to Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. So in some cases, the Addak was inscribed. In other cases, it wasn't. So we had to now come up with, what do we do? So what we did was, if it is in few places, and if it is available in handwritten manuscripts, which we consulted, and where it aided pronunciation and suited the meaning, since it is already present in the text in handwritten manuscripts, then we left it there. And we also know that Addak wasn't used during that era, you know? So, and we removed it if it was not needed and it was not available in the handwritten manuscripts. So my point is, 
we are very aware of what the issues surrounding the addak are mm. if they are available in the handwritten manuscript we left them there if they were available and created a consistency and age we left them there if it was not needed and it was not in the handwritten manuscript then we removed it because this is where we were facing many dilemmas mm. who are we to remove or add you know and this is why we resorted to the minimum standard that this this is what we will do with it and we applied something very similar to there are word endings with saharis and onkars mm -hmm. and there is a discrepancy on so many of them you know the word bajja the way it was written so there are some examples the way the way the word sangrah was written where sahari was added and bajja there was a dalam instead of a law and then ha uh, versus ha you know which are auxiliary verbs uh and garan you know without sehari and with sehari the word jaat with sehari without sehari the word pahan without sehari so things like that mm -hmm. where it changes grammatical understanding of it but not the meaning of it and then there were words which i mentioned where the meaning was completely getting changed and we consulted manuscripts on that as well because there is no agreement in the textual versions available and not just available we went into the ones which are not even available the digital digital forms of the manuscripts so the word pran versus pan is a good example of that you know pran means breath or life pan means hands you know which one do we go with then we had to look at the context and if we found what matched the context in the handwritten manuscripts then we went with that word so those are a couple of examples to show the kind of navigations we had to do where we had to be careful not to apply our mind because then it will become manmath but only apply what we are learning from the manuscripts themselves such that there is aid to pronunciation standardization meaning development so we can connect to the ideas of guru gobind singh maharaj Yeah, I think it's I think it's important to know the process as like an outside sort of listener who will who is interacting with this now and who will continue to um I think like part of what you said earlier about living in relationship to this um to this text is important because this process to me feels very much like a relationship of like a group of people who have great reverence for the text and have a, a sort of already existing relationship with the text who are still trying to have some kind of conversation with it and trying to sort of i don't know if do right by it is like a silly way to say that but i think it's important for for people like me to know that because it was by no means a simple process and from what i can tell it was a process that you kind of have to have great love for the thing that you're interacting with on that level you know like um you have to have great reverence and great devotion in order to to undergo a a task that way um but it's a little bit more than that so it is all of that it's also that we are no authority to figure out yeah. and say this is it Yeah. So we that's why we made extensive notes <laughs> because we know we are an infinitesimally small element and our job is not to create more issues but to show some uh, with utter respect yeah the difficulty mm -hmm. in presenting this uh so you know a 3 month project actually became a 12 month project yes. <laughs> and uh, so it is Harjinder Singh who was part of lot of part of this and then Bail Singh initially lots of our conversations were around but we cannot do this because mm -hmm. we cannot find this even if we think this is the right answer mm -hmm. because how do we know this we don't know why guru gobind singh maharaj did this or the one who wrote this either for guru gobind singh or guru gobind singh maharaj directly why they did what they did mm -hmm. but if there are printing issues if there are understanding issues between uh, what has come out in last 150 years and if we go before that where groups of people have studied this and what manuscripts are saying if we can navigate this mm -hmm. and try to present um in a very open and transparent manner what it is yeah. but still keep the focus on the idea uh, so we can develop 
uh, more than the love of Guru Gobind Singh, the love of Guru Gobind Singh's ideas and what Guru Gobind Singh's thought is in the context of what we now call the Indian realities, the Hindu and the yogic realities. Yeah, and I think kind of along that line, so you've mentioned Obel Singh and Harjinder Singh, and then there's another person who's involved who she's kind of coming at it from a different like generational angle, a different location angle. Um, so Kiran Kaur, um, who did the art for this project. I wanted to know kind of the thought process behind having this element in the project and and just a little bit about what that process looked like. Because I know you two worked very closely together um, and had many conversations before she even kind of put um, ink to paper. So I wanted to ask about, about that. So Kiran Kaur, very much so. She, in fact, was the first person I had the longest conversations with. Uh, it was the end of December uh, of 2021, uh, where I'm trying to think about, because, you know, December and January is that time where uh, multiple dimensions of Guru Gobind Singh's mm. um, just come together. Yeah. And, and as I described earlier, that part of me um, is troubled and pained by what we have done to it. So I was thinking, what do we do from visual angle? What is a contemporary individual who is not born in India or South Asia, whose first language is not English, you know, if they understand the message, how will they depict this? And I thought, you know, we already, and I would like to have uh, feminine and female lenses to this. It all cannot be just men. It's a generational differences are coming in. So a lot of the scholarship is all older men. And then I'm working with the younger, youngish men, younger than me on the beauty of it, on the recitation. And the, uh, but at the time we didn't know the complexity. So I said, okay, Kiran, would you like to work on this? Because she has worked with us on several projects as well, including on visualizations. But the challenge is you will not write any Gurbani word and you will not use any portrait. It's the idea. Can we bring the idea out? She says, yep, I'm down for it. I said, are you serious? We're going to work together. Uh, I'm going to explore this with you. I'm interested in sharing with you what I know about it, what they're saying to me, which again is not going to be a complete thing. And then I want you to come up with concept. I don't want you to give me any concept on Guru Gobind Singh Shabbat without getting at least wet with the Shabbat. You know, drenching is up to you. So that's what we did. I mean, I literally, in the first week of January, we set up a time. I flew to San Francisco. We basically, eight to five, it's like a workshop on Shabbats. Hmm. We're discussing words. We're discussing Shabbats. What is it saying to me? Which phrases are speaking to her? Who is this Shabbat speaking to? You know, what is this rag element? What are the colors associated with it? What kind of themes will be developed? You know, what phrases are being invoked? So we had incredible conversations in January of 2023 just on that. And I would say that challenged me as to uh, how little I understand the guru. I thought I understood much more of those words. It also challenged me to how these meanings will be conveyed because every time it is conveyed away from the original, it is not going to be as good. It is, it will never come close to it's the original. How do you acknowledge that and still do some justice to that here is a rendition. Here is what it's saying to me and here is what it is saying to Kiran now. And so that's how that process started. She started on it. She had her own navigation of her life. Life changes were happening for her. Multiple conversations after that, online meetings, concepts, you know, getting rid of several concepts, then re redoing them. But I'm so glad that she completed this and our editors and others have worked with her. This is her impression uh, after those workshops with her. So she's very much a part of this, that the visualizations of this uh, for her. Yeah, I um, I got to see kind of the notes and, and it was really cool to see the things that were pulled out as um, helpful sort of markers for what could happen visually. 
And I think something that I've been wondering about, and I know that, you know, you'll have your own conversations with her that people will get, um, get to listen to at a later date. But I am interested in like, just from reading the first couple of Shabbat's, there is this thing of like paradigms are being sort of acknowledged systems that already exist are being acknowledged images from those systems and practices from those systems are being acknowledged and then subverted. And it's like, how do you, <laughs> how do you even visualize that these paradigms are being acknowledged and then subverted rather than sort of running the risk of, of making it look, cause it is a visual thing like an endorsement. Um, and so, yeah, I was wondering if you had any insights on like, whether that presented any challenges, what sorts of things were kind of done to address those challenges. I think that would be really interesting to hear about. Well, th there was a challenge at every level and simply based on the theme of these others, because we are the separated ones. So it is going to be challenging. We start where, there. We want to be uh, minimizing our separations, right? As we see, the Guru's connection uh, and Guru showing us um, certain things in a certain way in a particular context. So, for example, when uh, Kiran did a couple of concepts, uh, Kiran Kaur, and uh, she, uh, you know, she thought she had it. I'm like, okay, so I looked at it. I'm like, this is actually bringing out what is being rejected. So, it's our perceptions also, right? What we sometimes we, but she thought she was, and then we looked at through more eyes, you know, and then we said, okay, maybe this needs to become more subtle. So how do you, what you said, how do you acknowledge? But that is not what the guru is after. Guru is acknowledging that you do this, we do this. People in who identify these practices do this, but he doesn't do this. And he does not acknowledge it for his connection with the one. So those kind of challenges very much were there. And the challenge was, how do you show the continuity of all these? You know, which elements will change and which elements will remain the same? Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of discussions on those elements. So this was not a hurried thing. We cannot do anything hurried with Gurbani or related to Pachas. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And when we do this, it becomes something else. And I'm not saying this is going to be not flawed. It is very much flawed. Everything we are doing interpretation included is not going to be perfect but it is uh, not just a serious attempt it's a it's a bit of a devotional attempt with some aptitude and rigor to come closer to presenting some ideas and hopefully many more will be inspired and they will actually develop a relationship with the shabbat with the bani itself before we talk about it before we write about it before we visualize it yeah, that's really, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that because I feel like um, each of you has like a very deep relationship with this project. It was so long and it was so rigorous. And so I'm excited to listen to those conversations eventually as well. Um, I think we can wrap up with two final questions, which is what, what did you get from working on this project personally? And what do you hope people get from this project as it sort of slowly makes its way out to them? So Jocelyn, eventually it is about celebrating the Guru. And we celebrate all of the Guru. There is no one thing we can celebrate because that will be separating it. Yeah. And one of the challenge, another challenge was, I really wanted somebody to sing those because nine of them have the rags prescribed and one of them has a khyal gaiki prescribed. And we looked for that, that can we get someone to do it? You know, somebody, and we weren't able to. So we just did a recommendation of a link of Pai Balbir Singh, uh, popularly known as, uh, who is no more Pai Balbir Singh Nihang because he did all of the shabads. And the way he does it, it's a jashan, it's a celebration, you know, like, you're mesmerized by it as well, because that's part of the singing, you know? Uh, so really that's, if, if, if we can celebrate the Guru through the beauty of the Shabbat, 
through the subtext, pretext, and the context of the shabar, uh, through the 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 pronunciation, the vocals of the shabar, the recitation of the shabar, because that's what people like me will be doing more, or people who can't sing, that's what they do most. And then listening to the celebratory angle of how Pai Balbir Singh sings it, and then looking at a interpret an interpretation, a visual interpretation of, uh, on on a on a digital canvas, if I may call it that, and then to do all of that, uh, bringing it together through one understanding in a translation and one commentary to make sense for us. So this really is celebration of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. Uh, so our separations, our hijars, you know, sabad hajare, the infinite wisdom in the shabad can help us get rid of our separations as it did for the Patsaha, Patsahi Dasmi, for the 10th sovereign. And sovereign is very, very important here. The sovereign is understanding the moods and the flavors of the rags, but it is not limited to that. It is taking us towards, regardless of the circumstances, on our own journeys of connecting with the one. So really that's the purpose at all levels. It really is a celebration of the Guru. And I, we will have varieties of celebration. Here is our offering in the current climate uh, of what is happening in the month in the community that maybe people will pause. Mm. Nine of those 10 shabbats ask us to pause yeah. and reflect. <laughs> and then one offers a khayal, which really is, khayal is something which came later in the musical sense. And we'll talk about it in a different episode. Uh, that first we need to get submerged in those shabbats. Yes. So that's what those 10 are. Mm -hmm. Those 10 are celebration as we understand as a team with multiple people that want some we named and some who are at the back end, editing it, making the videos, doing the podcast, mm -hmm. making the visuals and the graphics and much, much more. It's our way to celebrate the Pacha who is our sovereign and who is helping us connect with the one. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm very excited <laughs> for, for this series, and I hope that listeners are too. Um, after hearing some of the insights into sort of the vision and the process and the personal angle too, I hope that everyone will join us again next week where we will be speaking on Shabbat 1. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Vai Gurjika Khalsa, Vai Gurjika Khalsa.